So this is the first lesson in this uh, series entitled Forbidden Topics. When I say forbidden topics, it's, I, what I mean is that they're topics that don't get, uh, they don't get talked about much. And um, they certainly are not discussed from a Christian perspective in any, in any place uh, in the media or in the news. Uh, but they're important in the sense that uh, we, uh, we have to deal with these uh, you know, decisions concerning these uh, topics that I'll be uh, topic, talking about in the, uh, in the weeks to come. So our series is entitled Forbidden Topics, uh, Lessons That'll Get You Criticized, Called Out, or Canceled. And the lesson number one is entitled Mercy Killing or Selective Killing. In a documentary that I once saw on television concerning assisted suicide, a man traveled to Switzerland in order to engage a Swiss group to assist in his own death. He was an engineer. He was in his late 60s. He was suffering from Parkinson's disease. He was lucid, he was in control of his mind, but he was not able to walk without help. He spoke intelligently about his wish to end his life without regrets, not wanting to suffer his disease any longer. The interviewer asked him you know, about life after death and he said, well, he didn't believe in it. He had small reservations, but they could not, his reservations could not stop him from going through with what he was planning to do. One hour after the interview, and that was what the, uh, you know, the, uh, the draw factor was here for the, the television station, was that they were interviewing, interviewing him live. And one, after that, one hour after that interview, uh, he was dead from a drug overdose given to him by the assisted suicide group and all of this was legal. All of this was legal. As more and more uh, countries, of course, including many state governments here in the United States are drafting laws on this issue, I thought it'd be uh, good to get a biblical view. You know, all these lessons, these 13 lessons that I've planned, uh, you could call them, what does the Bible say about this and that and the other? So let's first talk about euthanasia. If you want to make something acceptable that has traditionally been rejected by society, simply give it a nicer sounding name. That's what we do. Abortion first became, you know, that's infant side. Well, we don't like that term. Let's change that to uh, pregnancy termination. Uh, that's not so bad or the mother's health, oh, that sounds even better. Or child molesters or pedophiles, well, that doesn't sound very good. They call themselves the man boy love society. That's their official title, sounds much better. Suicide is now referred to as euthanasia, which means good death or mercy killing or dignity in dying. In its present usage, the term euthanasia means the act directly to assist in the death as uh, painlessly as possible for one who is suffering incurable disease or lingering illness, which in the opinion of the ill or their supporters make life not worth living. So we need to make the difference between euthanasia and the right that a person has to choose a natural death. Those are not the same thing. A lot of people mix those two up. They think they are, but they're not. Natural death is where a long-term uh, comatose patient, for example, being artificially sustained is removed from this life-sustaining equipment and allowed to die naturally, allowing the body to just take its natural course. Natural death is an agreement between the doctors and the patients not to take any extraordinary measures 
to prolong a person's life when all reasonable expectation of recovery is no longer, is no longer present. There are, uh, there are already laws that exist that give doctors and patients the right to make decisions concerning their legal right to have a natural death if this is what they and their families and their doctors have decided. For example, remove life support when no potential for recovery is determined, allowing the person to die naturally. In other words, allow the body to just shut down the systems until natural death occurs. Or to refuse extensive treatment when the rate of success is very small. You know, when the doctors say, well, you know, we give you between a five and 10% chance of living after you go through all of this you know, treatment. Well, maybe you don't want to take that 10% chance. You don't want to go through all of that potential suffering and you'll say, you know what? I'd rather take you know, four or five months of reasonably healthy life and, and then go naturally than suffer. Or choose to have, as I say, several months of reasonable health over years of suffering with cancer treatment. It's a person's right to choose that. Now, we're all going to die and we do have a choice to experience our death when it is imminent. In most states, one document uh, records your wishes. We call it a, an advanced health care directive. They may have different names for it, but everywhere you know, has one of these. And I'll, I'll make a, you know, a commercial for this now. You know, if you don't have one of these, please you know, get the information and fill it out and leave it you know, with whoever's got your will and leave it with your, with your doctor, uh, particularly your primary care doctor so that people have directions, your directions, for what you want happen to you, should you not be able to make those decisions uh, by yourself. So that's natural, you know, natural death. Then we have uh, euthanasia or mercy killing. This is where someone kills you or helps you to kill yourself with poison or drugs or something. This is not letting the body just take its natural course until death occurs. This is, a, this is at, at, at 3 p.m. you're alive, and then uh, according to your choice, at 3.05 you're dead because you did something. That's euthanasia. It's not the acceptance of an unavoidable impending death. It's the imposition of death to end suffering. For example, Alzheimer patients who kill themselves rather than allowing the Alzheimer and other conditions uh, to end their lives. Now, I'm not making a judgment call here. I'm just saying, this is what this is. This is what it is, okay? Arthritis, you know, everybody's got a little arthritis. You get a little older, the joints get a little sick, but some people really suffer terribly from arthritis. So arthritis sufferers who ask someone to end their lives because they can no longer deal with uh, the pain. And so euthanasia is a willful act that causes the immediate death of the individual. And so uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a difference between allowing a person to die naturally, you know, letting the body shut itself down and actually causing that person's death using artificial means. So let's look at the history of this issue a little bit. You know, how did it develop? Suicide, of course, is nothing new. The Greek philosophers considered it a most noble way to die, to end your own life. Very noble, very upper class. The Japanese in more recent history, World War II, for example, and many radical Muslim groups today see suicide as a useful tool in war. Suicide bombers, you know, World War II would go straight to, you know, straight to their targets. In the same way, uh, extremists, terrorists today, 
uh, strap themselves with a bomb and you know, go to the place where they can inflict the maximum damage, uh, usually on innocent civilians. Um, in the West, however, suicide under any of its newer names has developed as an acceptable option only, and this is the important part, only as the value of human life has gone down. So the more we, or the less we value human life as a society, the more that euthanasia becomes a viable option. There's the balance between the two. In pagan nations, suicide was a clean and honorable way to avoid the unpleasantness of old age or public disgrace. I go back to Japan uh, where public honor was very important. And if you were disgraced publicly in some way, uh, many times would just commit suicide. Since this life was the only life, again, in pagan nations, nations that had no thought of the afterlife, since this life was the only life, once it became unpleasant, the easy option was simply to end it as quickly and painlessly as possible. Now, believers, however, have always put the highest premium on human life because it was created in the image of God. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And God expressly forbids murder, and that includes suicide, the killing of self, Exodus chapter 20. The Hebrews, for example, who had their share of suffering, nevertheless abhorred the taking of one's own life. The Christians, especially in the early years, early first century, who suffered tremendous persecution and torment, never considered suicide as an option, and they did not for the very same biblical reasons. Suicide was never an acceptable option for Western society based on the Judeo-Christian ethic. Those who committed suicide were considered insane or, or hopelessly depressed. You know, that was the idea. If you committed suicide, then you were sick. You were you know, mentally deranged if you did such a thing. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, Roman Catholics refused to bury those who committed suicide in their cemeteries. And I remember that as a kid. In my family, there were people that committed suicide. And uh, yeah, I remember in Montreal, uh, those of you who've been to Montreal, you know, on the mountain, Mount Royal, there are two cemeteries on Mount Royal. People don't know that. One side is the Catholic cemetery and the other side is the Protestant cemetery. So if you couldn't get into the Catholic cemetery, you might be able to get in on the, the Protestant cemetery, but it was an issue that was taken quite seriously. Uh, so uh, even insurance companies refused to pay policies for such deaths under the violent death clause, considering suicide a form of murder, disqualifying the person from collecting benefits. And of course, well, we can understand why. Some guy's got a lot of debts. He's got five little kiddos and a wife. All of a sudden he's got cancer. He finds out, you know, he, he gets himself a policy for a million bucks or whatever it is. You know, he deals with the cancer for a while and then you know, he doesn't want to suffer anymore. So he just, uh, he, he tries to uh, perhaps fake his death. He commits suicide to collect the insurance. So insurance companies are very wary about things like that. The idea of self-inflected death or mercy killing by another name gained support as our society moved away from its Christian roots. People began to accept the evolutionary theory of life where there is no God, but only an ever evolving species of life on earth. So if man is just matter, then what does death matter? And what does it matter which way you die? if all it is, if life is just matter. Philosophers in the 19th and early 20th century began to teach that the only value of life is what that life produces and experiences. In other words, life is valuable in what it produces. 
art, music, success, sex, fame, power, knowledge. These are the things that determine the value of someone's life. So we arrive at the beginning of the 21st century and have a society that sees man as nothing more than an intelligent animal and life valued only by what one has experienced or contributed to the rest of society. So if you are intelligent and creative and wealthy, your life is valuable. If you are poor or sick and uneducated, then your life is not very valuable. I'm generalizing here, of course, for the sake of time, but this is essentially the thinking that permits people to support and promote euthanasia as a viable option to deal with illness and, and suffering. Of course, it does deal with suffering and pain. There's no question of this. Also, uh, there's no question that many do it out of concern and, and, and our objection is the method and not the motivation. You know, how many movies have we seen? We may have, uh, many of us may have witnessed this in real life, but how many movies have we seen where the suffering spouse you know, is, is, is you know, euthanized by a loving husband or loving wife because they just can't stand to see the person suffer or a child, you know what I mean? And, and then there's a big court case and it's very dramatic and you know, it pulls on the heartstrings, of course. But if life is value, by what you experience and what you create, then if you are no longer able to experience or contribute because of illness or of age, then that means your life is no longer as valuable as it was and you should be able to end it in whatever way you want. That's the thinking. This thinking reverts back to basic paganism because it eliminates God as a factor in life and death. And it judges the value of a person's life only based on physical criteria. So your life is valuable based uh, on what you experience sensually or what a person contributes physically or philosophically or, or artistically. How many times have I heard people say, she has no quality of life, why not just end it? In speaking of the old or the sick or the handicapped. How many times have you heard that? And I mean, not in movies. I've heard that in hospital rooms and in nursing homes. Oh, she has no quality of life. You know, just as soon, you know, it's a quick injection, you know? I mean, there's no quality of life here. And so the sum of these two are referred to, as I say, the quality of life. In other words, what you've contributed and what you can experience. And if you're contributing a lot and you're experiencing a lot, then your value is, is high. But if you're not contributing anything and you can't, experiencing, you can't experience very much, then your value goes down. When your value goes down, you become expendable. Now there's a danger in euthanasia. The idea of euthanasia under any name is dangerous for several reasons. First, it reduces the value of life and it does so artificially. You know, life is more than what we feel or produce. Life is who we are. Life is what we represent. Life is in whose image we are made. The basis of our culture has been that every life may have uh, different gifts and abilities, but each was equally valuable because of its spiritual nature. That used to be the thinking. It has been this belief that has motivated medicine as well as all the helping professions. Why help the down and out drunk on the street who contributes nothing, you know, he urinates in public, he has nowhere to sleep, he stinks. 
If he has a chance, if he has a dollar, or he'll go buy a bottle of beer. You know, I mean, he, he feels nothing, he gives no, what value do, does he have? Why have people, decade after decade after decade, why have groups and churches and individuals helped that person? I, I, you know, I'm picking a you know, common denominator. Why? Because those groups and those churches believed no matter what, that individual is made in the image of God. Underneath all of that ugliness and you know, underneath all of that terrible exterior, there is the image of God there. A child of God exists. This is, this is what motivated. You know, the people that take care of a lot of the homeless people downtown, you know, uh, the Jesus house, <laughs> you know, call it the Jesus house for nothing. When each life is equally valuable in this way, and it's equally valuable regardless of your color, regardless of your age, regardless of your deformity, regardless of your illness, then we have the motivation to care for and feel right about ministering to everyone with an equal effort. I remember watching, you know, again, dramas, doctor, you know, medical dramas from the 60s, you know, and uh, uh, a killer would come in. You know, a guy who had shot up a, a store, you know, rob, rob a bank and killed three people, you know, an old lady and a kid and whatever, and the, the bank teller, you know, and then was mortally wounded on the scene of the crime. And, and they rushed that guy, you know, uh, Joe the killer to the hospital, you know, and he came into the emergency room and, and the doctors were, they were working on him, you know, and they say, who is this guy? He's Joe Killer. He's the guy you heard on the radio that killed those three people, blah, blah, blah. And there's a slight pause as the, 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 the surgeons and the emergency room team look at each other and then they, they just dive right in to save this guy's life. Why? Well, because they come from a training that says every life is valuable. Even Joe Killer was originally made in the image of God. And even doctors didn't see their role as playing God, but rather respecting what God had made. It's the intrinsic value of life or rather if the intrinsic value of life is reduced and it's measured only by experience and productivity, it will create an elitist society where like animals, only the fittest will survive. Only the fittest will be allowed or encouraged to survive. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like Nazi Germany. Euthanasia is dangerous because mercy killing leads to selective killing. When society justifies the concept of mercy killing in its most extreme cases, it always starts with the most extreme case. For example, an incredibly suffering woman put out of her misery uh, by an uh, overdose of pain medicine. You know, because the poor woman was just, she couldn't stand it anymore. We always use the extreme example to make the point. Well then, it's only a step to add new categories that we would have never dreamed of before. For example, abortion. Abortion is a form of mercy killing. We destroy the baby to save the mother the suffering of having another child, or having the child of a rapist, or giving birth to a sick child, or giving birth to a child that is inconvenient. And yet we're saying, you know, we're doing this for the mother, to have mercy on her. If you kill the unborn, and those who no longer enjoy life because of illness, believe me, it's only a step to eliminate the elderly in homes. You know how much money it costs to maintain the elderly in homes? 
Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, their medicine, uh, all of that stuff, the people to take care of them day after day. That's a lot of money. Be a lot easier to just empty those homes. How about the severely handicapped? Let's face it, they don't know what's going on. They can't, you know, they can't run, they can't play, they can't get married, they can't have kids, blah, 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 blah. What enjoyment are they having in life? What are they contributing? How about the mentally insane? How about criminals? How about people who just don't agree with you? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd start there myself, but anyways, that's a little levity there. <laughs> the real danger is that once society accepts it, here it comes. Once society accepts it, then the government will legislate it and control it. Wake up, folks. That's how it works. And not, not just here, that's how it works everywhere. It would be a lot cheaper to eliminate all the people that I've just talked about than to care for them. This is one of the potential problems that arise when governments start to have exclusive authority over medicine. I'm not saying that the government doesn't have a role to play in society and in the care of society in medicine. I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in that. But I've seen, coming from Canada, I've seen enough of when the government controls 100% of something, how that works. Not always good. People think that this is an exaggeration, but who would have thought that we would be passing laws, for example, encouraging homosexual education in our schools and giving them rights to adopt children. How many people would even think that would be possible 50 years ago? And in the last decade, we've accepted homosexuality as normal. And now the government is writing laws to protect it, to protect the behavior. In 20 years from now, we will be the ones who will be in the last years of our lives. And at this rate, it's not impossible that the government will give doctors the right to eliminate those who are no longer useful. That would be us. Martin Mymoller, Protestant preacher, who was imprisoned and killed by the Nazis in World War II, wrote of the danger of not confronting evil. He said, in Germany, they came first for the communists and I didn't speak because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak up because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for Catholics and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me and by that time, no one was left to speak up. Finally, euthanasia is dangerous because it violates God's word. God's word is very clear on the treatment of human beings and very clear about how God will deal with those who violate his word. The entire matter is summarized in two of his commands. First, thou shalt not kill. You know, that's not a hard one to memorize. Exodus 20, 13 in the New Testament, the idea repeated in Romans 13, 9. Human life is created in God's image. He gives life and he takes it away, Job 121. Man is authorized to take life to protect society, Romans 13, four. This is the only time that God gives man that right. You know, the police, the judicial system, military. Man has no God-given right to cause the death of anyone of anyone, the unborn, the handicapped, the old, the sick. When a person does this for whatever reason, that person will answer to God regardless of what human laws say. And it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And then that second command I said, it's two commands. 
however you want people to treat you, so treat them, Matthew 7, verse 12. Pretty straight ahead. If you are ill or poor or old or handicapped or insane or suffering, would you want them to eliminate you because you're no longer productive? Because you, you, you no longer can enjoy a football game? The Bible is filled with the admonitions on how to treat people in various situations of age and suffering. Very quickly, uh, the Bible says, uh, provide for widows and orphans, James 1.27. Respect and honor the aged, Leviticus 19.39. Plead the cause of the poor and the oppressed, Isaiah 1.11. The strong are to help the weak, Romans 15, 1. We are to do good to all men, that includes all men, Galatians 6, 10. Honor parents, even when they're old, Ephesians 6, 2. Bear the burdens of those who struggle for whatever reason, Galatians 6, verse 2. Pray for those who are sick, James 5, 14. Nowhere in the Bible does God give us a command, an example, or a conclusion uh, that to end someone else's life is the solution to their suffering uh, of mental or physical pain. Nowhere, we, no inference even, doesn't even come close. On the contrary, suicide is always seen in a negative light. Two examples of suicide, one in the Old Testament, Saul you know, falls on his sword. Did he have another chance? Did, did he have another option? Yes. He could have done like David and called out to the Lord and say, Lord, save me. He could have cried out to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. Even if the enemy was going to kill him, but he didn't. He did the same thing that he did from the very beginning. He took matters into his own hands. And from the very beginning, wasn't that his bug? Wasn't that his bugaboo? Wasn't that his failing? He didn't wait for Samuel, he took things in his own hands. And then when things got really bad and you know, he was threatened with death, instead of calling out to God, no sir, he took things, matters into his own hands. And Judas hung himself out of despair. No way God could forgive me, might as well end it all. Mercy killing may be an easy solution for society and a quick end for those uh, for the individual, but it is a short-sighted action that disregards the warning that it is given to man to die once and then comes the, uh, the judgment. The mercy killers not only hasten death, but they hasten God's judgment upon themselves. Remember this guy? Dr. Kevorkian, doctor who practiced euthanasia, went to court, big trials, he was acquitted. But he still has to be judged in God's court. And then you may be less familiar with this guy, but if you come from Canada, you know who he is, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. He was a famous abortionist. I mean, led the charge, led the marches, had an abortion clinic, fought the fight. The government of Canada gave him the Order of Canada, the highest civilian honor. <laughs> He's also passed away. I guarantee you he won't be honored by God. And so Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church about death and in his letter he said, I do not, let me put it up there, I do not want you to be uninformed as do the rest who have no hope. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the pagans. They have no hope when facing death. In death, as in life, as in triumph, as in tragedy and suffering, the difference uh, is that some have faith and hope and others do not. Suicide makes sense if there's no God, if there's no heaven, if there's no judgment, if there's no tomorrow, okay, take me out of here, I've had enough. Is, is this the best that there is? I can, I can honestly say to you, there was a, a moment in my life before I became a Christian, a moment in my life when I asked myself, is this all there is to life? I mean, I tried everything, done everything, you know, whatever. 
that it? That, is that as excited as, as, as it gets? Is that as much as what money can buy you? Is, you know, after having tried it all, okay, there's nothing better than this? And I remember that, that, that thought going through my mind, well, there's, if this is it, then I'm not interested in hanging around for another 50 years. But for those who have faith in Christ and a hope for eternal tomorrow, there are three promises that God gives us to help us face suffering because there is suffering in life and death. Three promises. Promise number one is he will, he will listen. First Peter five, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God promises that he'll listen when we put our sorrows upon him in prayer. He will support us when we are down, when we call out to him. I revert back to my story you know, that I just said to you a moment ago. And I remember saying at that time, okay, if you're out there, God, if you're really out there, I'm going to try to find you. If you're really out there, you'll let me find you. I didn't say the rest of the sentence, but the rest of the sentence was, but if I can't find you, then the gig's up. And then you know the story. I opened the newspaper one day and I saw that little ad that said, sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. The little light went on. You know that story. Second promise, he will help. God promises that no temptation, this includes a trial of suffering of any kind, will be greater than you can bear. First Corinthians 10, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. There's nothing you're going through that others haven't done before. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. It's not just sin temptation, you know, uh, tempted to drink or cheat in your wife or whatever. It's not that that he's, only that he's talking about. He's talking about the tests in life. I lost my job, I lost my health, I lost my wife, I lost my child, I, you know, I lost my self-esteem. Those kind of tests. He will not allow you to be tempted, tested beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he'll provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. And the way of escape is not a big mystery. The way of escape is prayer. God, help me. I'm not making it. I'm acknowledging to you, God, and I'm telling you the truth right now, I am not making it. I, I, I want to quit. Please don't let me fail. We mustn't be afraid of not being able to bear it. God promises he'll help you. And then the third promise, he'll be there. Hebrews 13, five, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. Not just the money you have, the health you have, the strength you have, the position you have, the opportunity you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. God assures us that he will never leave us. And that includes our moment of death. People are afraid to die alone. Why do you think we have you know, like death watch parties? Grandma's passing away. She's in the, you know, the last the heavy, you know, quick breathing stage there. And we know there's not a lot. And people are coming in and out of her room if she's at home or at the, the nursing home. And they're, they're bringing in coffee and sandwiches and they're sitting around and they're talking. You know, they're waiting. They're waiting for her to go. They don't want her to go you know, by herself. And how many times have said, well, look, I got to go here, there. All right, I'll just be, I'm going to go to the vending machine to get a coffee. <laughs> 
Time's just going to come back. And they come back and oh, grandma's gone. And then the rest of their life, oh, she didn't die if she's a believer. She didn't die alone. God says, I will never leave you. Never means never. We know he'll always be with us in heaven, but here on earth, that moment of death, that time you cross the threshold where your family or your friends, they can't follow you. Who do you think is there with you? He's there with you. That's the promise, don't be afraid. I'll be there for you. Even if you know, your sister went out to get coffee, don't worry, I'll be there for you. These promises and assurances prepare us to meet every suffering, every challenge, even our death with confidence that we can put our lives into God's hands until it's time for us to leave. The pagan, the doubter, the unbeliever has no hope and killing himself or another may seem merciful, but for the Christian, the only option is to put his life and the life of, of the loved ones into the hands of a merciful God who will comfort the heart, limit the suffering, receive us into heaven when he will, uh, his will rather, will be completely served. So, you know, Jesus could have chosen mercy killing in order to avoid the suffering of the cross, but he looked ahead to the glorious resurrection for himself and for all those who would believe in him. And so to those who believe, I encourage you to keep your faith in God and he will sustain you and those you love through the trials of suffering and also death. And he will be with you right to the eternal life in heaven that you begin to have with him after the moment of death. Okay, so some thoughts about euthanasia next week more happiness and joy. We're going to talk about superstition, astrology, and the occult. Make sure this week you figure out what your sign is, okay? So we can talk about that. Thank you very much.